Aldi's Isle of Shame. This is the focus group. They're all business, except when they're not. It's the focus group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Welcome to the Focus Group. John Nash here with my good friend and co-host, Tim Bennett. You could find us here weekly, or all our media, of course, is at focusgroupradio.com. And I don't, I shouldn't say it's of course, you need to be told that. So it's focusgroupradio.com. You'll also learn about our podcast, TFGM Button. If you are an audio fan, that's probably dropping into your feed of choice already. But if you want to watch the video of the Focus Group, which we're doing right now, that drops on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube and the Facebook Live channel. Mr. Bennett, welcome to May, which just blows my mind because it didn't really feel like we had a winter, and here we are no. like at the doorstep of summer, right? Did you guys get any snow in New York? Yeah, we did. We did. We got a yeah, little here in the city. We got some upstate. You had shovelable, yeah. shovel, shovelable snow. Shovelable snow. Um, shovelable. I did upstate. I did shovel twice, <laughs> but that... If that were a if that were a metric for climate change, I go back ten years. I remember one time we had back to back storms which dropped like at, at the house upstate, fourteen inches one storm, five days or four days later we got another fourteen inches. And I remember when I shoveled, remember when you were a kid and this happened, yeah. you would have that wall of snow. <laughs> but no, I'm, we yeah. yeah, it doesn't happen that way. I like those days. So we have an outdoor shower down here at the beach, which a lot of the houses do, which I actually do like in the summer to shower. Even if I don't go to the beach, I like to shower outside. But I tried to fix it, and I did something with my hand over the weekend. I tried to fix the pipes. One of the pipes broke. So Richard insisted I call a plumber, but I insisted to do it myself. So I watched a YouTube tutorial, and uh, I'm about halfway there. So we'll <laughs> aren't you waiting on a tool like a little cheap tool <laughs> little cheap tool because the pipe actually broke with inside the uh the pvc pipe broke inside the other pipe fitting and uh, it's impossible to get out i thought of actually heating it up since it's plastic i thought could i get a candle and heat it and melt oh, it? oh boy oh boy listen to you it, when you say it's plastic is it pvc it's pvc pipe right so i thought it was plastic mm. that's plastic right so can't, does it melt does that melt that easily i don't know but anyway, I'm waiting for this tool. So they found that there's this little tool called a nipple extractor, PVC nipple extractor or something. And it's got a T on it. Remember the logo for Telluride with the T would look like a pickaxe? So it's got this yes, T. Yeah. It's got a pickaxe with this little nubbly thing at the end of it, half inch round. And that grabs that I put it into the hole and supposed to pull it in and twist. So we'll see what happens next week. Tune in. <laughs> Might be an I Love Lucy episode where our uh, Lucille. Remember they got caught in the shower. Remember that episode? Yes, where I do. <laughs> they were going to fix the shower. So it's the same sort of thing. We'll see. By the way, that's kind of become one of our um, Pluto TV has turned into this kind of oasis for us. So I don't know how you guys are down. You have Xfinity. We have Spectrum. I would say that a good ninety five percent. Uh, if you if you had a hundred channels, we might watch six or seven mm -hmm. with any maybe. frequency. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, and lately, I just tune out a lot of the news because it's the talking heads going on and on about the hush money trial and this and that and that and this and and so we pop over to Pluto and it's sometimes really fun. And one of the default channels for us and our program favorites is of course the I love Lucy channel. And it doesn't really matter what show we drop into, whether they've had little Ricky, whether they're in Hollywood, whether they're in Europe, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. 20, 25 minutes go by the mood changes. We're, we're in a great mood. Then Bob sometimes switches to dynasty. And I would say that uh, three out of seven or three out of eight times we tune into Alexis and, Crystal having a cat fight <laughs> involving fight. a fountain or a pool. <laughs> and the world just seems easier. You'll have to put Buzzer on your list. Oh, we love Buzzer. Yeah, I, I love I the watched, game shows. Yeah, I watched it the other morning. It was one of the old black and whites of I've Got a Secret where everybody was smoking. And <laughs> actually, Lucille Ball was the guest. And went, okay. uh, But the one guy before, the big secret, was this guy uh, had sailed from Washington, D.C. area down the intercoastal highway in a paper boat. He paper, a paper, yeah, a paper boat. boat. Yeah, that was the big secret. How did they so, figure uh, that out? 
Well, they didn't. Um, okay. They actually, they actually had asked all their questions, and they got through, and the guy got his 80 bucks or whatever, which uh, I used to love those old shows because there's actually one earlier versions from the early 50s I, if would beat the clock, and they haven't seemed to show those much anymore, but they used to show them. Your consolation prize was a carton of Winston's. Yes. Winston cigarettes. Can you imagine you're on this game show, <laughs> you know, and it's so-and-so. But the guests didn't come from too far away. These were all done in New York City obviously taped in New York City. And so the guests were all from kind of North Jersey, Southern mm-hmm. Connecticut, you know, the <laughs> suburbs of New York, New York City, or the boroughs. And uh, your consolation prize, if you didn't win, you'd get a, you'd get a carton of cigarettes. I think that... Um, the thing <laughs> As if that everyone fa- smoked, I guess Well, they did. did. You, know, that's yeah. the, you know, you look at TVs and movies, and people had cigarettes in their hands all the time. It was really yeah. a different time period. And... You and I remember when we entered the workforce uh, officially after college, people still smoked in offices. Oh, yeah. My boss smoked. He, had, he always had the window open a crack mm-hmm. in his office because uh, he had smelled. a window. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, would, he would smoke, smoke, smoke. And uh, I had another boss. He would light one off the next one. He would just kept smoking, <laughs> smoking, smoke. He was the headhunter. He smoked Tarrington 100s. Remember Tarrington. those? Tarrington. <laughs> yes, I do. The red stripe. Thing. Uh-huh. And in watching, and when I watch Dynasty on Pluto, I'm reminded of the fact that my first business partner chose the cigarette that he smoked, which was the Moore 100s, because Alexis smoked them. <laughs> they were those little brown, right, long tipperillo brown, skinny, kind of skinny brown ones. Yeah, yeah that's right. He did cigarette. smoke those, didn't he? Yes, and he and he he got it from her, from Alexis. But wasn't Canada. his thought was he'd smoke less because they were skinny or something? Wasn't and they were long. The yeah, day? but he ended up he was like a two packer a day. I remember when he went to the started going to the gym. And his trainer, he had a trainer. The trainer's like, you know, you, you're healthy enough to run a marathon. And I, I dreamed of the day when he would run a marathon and run up to the finish line and with the cigarette <laughs> burning, you know, burn the rope and boom, he won. In fact, I called it the more 100 or the more marathon or something. <laughs> Everybody in the office loved that. They would laugh. He'd laugh the hardest because he thought it was hysterical. I said, you'd probably run the marathon while smoking. Was he that healthy? Uh, you know, he... That's what he said. I guess he was right. You know, he, 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 <laughs> he had the, as he would say, he had an admirable. His trainer would say he had an admirable physique. I'm like, of course you do. You're smoking two packs a day and you're eating a chiclet. Right. <laughs> so, he didn't eat much, did he? No. He was crazy. No. Super. Smart. I mean, you don't have to say anything, but I, I mean, he he was uh, he was a different different uh, different sort of animal, yeah, which like, you know is what a lot of those. Early mm-hmm. agency creatives were, yep. right? Or not, not a creative, but I would say agency leaders, or because you were the head creative. But um, he he was certainly a character, <laughs> indeed. And and, and that's where the story poof Jeanette comes from. The, his brothers came in and knocked over the Christmas tree, and a branch pierced the Jeanette box, and the powder blew up. <laughs> poof Jeanette. <laughs> Days gone by. All right. Well, without further ado, folks, we do open the show by doing what we do now. We just had some banter. We are going to do a segment called Caught Our Eye. We bring stories to each other's attention. We visit with our partner here on the Focus Group Deep Discount. Then we have Business Birthday and a Shop Talk, which I teased about Aldi's Isle of Shame, um, which I think you'll get a kick out of. So without further ado, Mr. Bennett, what caught your eye? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. So I was uh, scrolling through this headline caught, had caught my eye, and I think it's uh, and I wanted to get your opinion of it. It's a it's a pretty short or easy concept. The headline is: Man buys fourteen thousand dollar Cartier earrings for fourteen dollars after the company posts the price error on the website. So Cartier uh, on their website in Spanish. So this was uh, in Mexico. Uh, the guy's name was uh, Rogelio. Uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the last name, Villarreal, but I'll say the uh, the consumer, Rogelio, was scanning. He was bored, and he was just scanning different websites and whatever at home and was passing through Cartier's website and had seen on there. He said he broke out into a cold sweat. He saw on there uh, listed a pair of solid gold and diamond earrings for 237 pesos, which was the equivalent of $14 US. It was a typo, it was supposed to have been 237,000 pesos, which was $14,000. So he looked at it and looked at it and he thought, well, he couldn't figure it out, so he ordered two sets. Mm. 
So for $28, he ordered these, uh, which would have been $28,000 worth of earrings. So what happened was, Car so he orders these earrings, and then Cartier catches on that, whoa, 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 what's going on here? Because it he put in his credit card information, and then it accepted them. And they see that it was $28 instead of 28000 Somebody catches it there in shipping, I guess. And so they went back and forth with him. And Cartier kept saying, oh, this was a mistake. We, we will, we'll give you a consolation prize or consolation uh, something instead of the jewelry. And uh, he said, no, I want you to back the price. You need to honor the price. So he went to the Mexican government authorities, which did support him, and they backed his position that the company needs to honor the advertised price. <laughs> so after months of going back and forth, he finally got the earrings last week, and he posted a video of himself with the merchandise. He ended up giving one pair to his mom and uh, is going to decide what to do with the other pair right now. But it said some people were picking on him. Some said that uh, he shouldn't have taken advantage, that this was a mistake. Some claimed he should give them back or pay taxes on 28000 instead of $28. Somebody else called him a thief. So he said social media was going crazy um, against him. But he had just felt that he was scrolling through and saw these and bought them. And uh, it was the company's uh, mistake for having the wrong price. The He did say what they, one of the news people asked him what Cartier offered him. I just shook my head. So instead of the $28,000 or the $14,000 a pair, but the $28,000 earrings, they offered him a bottle of champagne instead. Why don't you take a uh, bottle of champagne? Can you imagine? Uh, you know, I'm speechless, frankly. A bottle of champagne. Yeah. So they, they wouldn't have offered him a go golden, away. a jewelry bracelet <laughs> or something that was at least of value. I mean, like even a ten thousand dollar thing, right? And let's get the twenty eight thousand yeah. back. No, they offered him a bottle of champagne to have it all go away. He's like, no, no, no. He said that, uh, so the Mexican authorities said, and when they talked to a spokesperson for the Consumer Protection Agency in Mexico, said companies have to respect the published prices if they made a mistake or if there is a mistake in a company's website, it's not the consumer's fault. And so that's the position of the Mexican government. So I was just wondering what you thought. Do you think the guy's a crook? Do you think he's a thief? What do you think? I agree with the Mexican authorities. If 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 the website is published for the public and they advertise a product and you buy it, if for whatever reason they've done something, they have messed up on the pricing, I don't think that's the consumer's fault. It seems to me that if that were, you know, wasn't there something about like if a store did a flyer, for example, right. that you got in the mail with a newspaper and there was a misprinted price? That there was a way that, that they had to honor that, right? Like, I don't see why the web is any different. Someone yeah. made a mistake. It's it's not like when you were at the Four Seasons doing shots of that tequila from the, the Delft bottle that we thought was like, you know, pennies on that. We thought it was pesos. It was dollars. <laughs> because you had to, the, the, the comma, we didn't move the comma far enough before, you know. No, I think that, um, and, and Cartier, frankly, could have avoided this. As I think you're, the way you concluded the story with the bottle of champagne is all you need to know. If you have an aggrieved customer who was in the right because it, right. you had a, something posted wrong, well, can we give you this beautiful gold charm bracelet for your mother or something? It's a value of 5000 Whatever the number is, he might have actually returned the earrings. Maybe? Yeah. Yeah, or if, if they said to him, we'll give you a $5,000 credit or we'll give you something else. But no, I... I, um, I I, I'm with him. We did a story a while back where there was something else because this happened in banking a lot. Remember where people would go to their ATM or their bank account would be wrong and they mm -hmm. would take the money out. But for whatever reason with banking, the banks Can could always claim, claim the money back, yeah. right? So that's the mistake didn't go into the favor of the consumer. But I think since it, I think in situations like this, the, the, uh, it seems to be in Mexico and I think in the U S it's, it's not the consumer's fault. So it, uh, these agents, consumer protection agencies, side with the consumer. So start, start scrolling those websites, John. Twenty-eight grand value. Now yeah. he doesn't know what he's doing with the second set of earrings. Hold on to it for about a month. Pop it up on <laughs> eBay or on something eBay. and sell it. So he's going to give make it to out. if you know if he has a wife in the future or sister or something. Who knows? But I'm sure his mother was appreciative. Well. Um, for caught my eye, for my caught my eye, uh, jewelry and gold seems to be that Tim something crossed over star wise this this week because uh, 
Mine involves relics uh, from the Titanic, namely a gold pocket watch, which is worn by the richest passenger on the ship, and a leather valise, uh, which had the uh, carried the violin of the band member who played on the, the sinking ship as it went down. These went up for auction recently. So the uh, watch is sold for a record-breaking $1.5 million. It was worn by John Jacob Astor IV, a member of mm. the wealthy Astor family, and he was the richest man on the Titanic when it sailed. Um, and the valise uh, was... It just said the valise held the violin famously played by the band leader as the ship sank, and that went for... Uh, 360,000 euro so it was and, and the and the violin itself is like 1.1 million or something so the thing i was intrigued by about this was these are objects that were actually retrieved from the bodies of the people that were floating on the surface of the water after the ship sank so there's this whole thing when they discovered the titanic wreck when ballard found it years and years ago there was this mysterious thing that they would see where they would find pairs of shoes just laying in pairs on the bottom of the ocean. And they finally figured out that the tannin in the leather of the shoe preserved it from being eaten by these microscopic organisms. But sadly, the body that used to have the shoes on was completely destroyed and, and you know, eaten or broken down by the microbes in the ocean, which is kind of creepy when you think about it, right? <laughs> So after the ship sank and the Carpathia reached the, dest re reached the site of the Titanic sinking, not only did they retrieve the lifeboats with everybody that was left, the, the few passengers that had survived, but floating in the water was deck chairs and luggage right. and, and anything and, and the bodies of people. So this was that the watch was actually recovered. The pers a personal effect was recovered from Astor's body after it sank. One of the lucky ones where they could actually retrieve the body for a proper So he burial. did it because he was wealthiest. He didn't get on a lifeboat. No, his wife Penelope did though. She was pregnant, right. and again, like the movie, it was you know women and children first. Right. So he was a gentleman, and he made sure that she was safe and that he stayed on board the ship. The watch was um, originally um, when the watch was recovered. Uh, the family actually spent a good deal of money restoring it to completely perfect working order. Um, and it was held in, after that by the Dobin family, um, and they kept it until the late 1990s, and then it went up for auction recently here. An unnamed collector in the U.S. bought the watch. I think that's always interesting when someone spends that kind of money and then they request anonymity. I don't blame them. Um, it's one of these funny things to me, though. So you're buying a gold, a beautiful gold pocket watch. They're out of fashion. We don't use pocket watches anymore. It did belong to John Jacob Astor. It was from the night of the sinking of the Titanic. So I guess the provenance is what you're really paying for. But after you buy it and you have it in a little display case, like what did, you know, I guess you talk about it. Like, what would you ever do something like that? Would you ever buy a well, watch I was, like this? I was wondering about that. I thought, I'm surprised this didn't end up in a museum or something. Mm. That or someone did not buy it that was affiliated with the family. That because uh, I guess it would be a artif It's certainly an artifact and a historic of historic significance. I suppose. I I should know this, and maybe you do. What song were they playing as the boat went down? Does anybody know? Oh, supposedly the song was called "Nearer, My God, to Thee." Oh God! Yeah, I played I, at my, I was played at my grandfather's funeral. You know what I'm talking about. You know the song. Yeah. It's a famous... Yeah. yeah, so supposedly it was nearer my God to thee, and the band stayed on the ship until the end. They they went down with the uh, with the Titanic. I mean, when you if you watch the movie Titanic, obviously uh, the romance and all the... Some of the characters are sort of made up, but James Cameron worked hard to get a lot of the historical details correct um, in terms of the actual sinking. I don't know. It would be horrific to have been on, on that thing and maiden voyage, a ship that could not be sunk... Boom. Thanks. <laughs> by, by the way, when I was a kid, my two biggest obsessions before science fiction hit was um, the Titanic and the Hindenburg. Now, I thought they were the most luxurious ways to travel, and they both suffered horrible disasters. You know? <laughs> See, so Just, guess what? When that spaceship comes along, stay away. When Nash is involved, it's going to yeah, be a major <laughs> catastrophic event for the can, first space trip. Maiden voyage is good. Yeah, don't get on board. <laughs> I used to go to the Middlebury Public Library. My mom, you know, this is, again, hearkening back to a day gone by. Like, I think the library was maybe two miles up the road. 
Um, and we would get on our bikes and ride up. And one day the librarian, I come in and she, she knew the kind of books that I took out. She goes, John, 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 I got a special one for you. And she goes to the office and she takes out this hardback book and, it, and she opens it up and it was all about the Hindenburg. And the thing that I loved about it was the book, when it opened to the center, had pages that folded out. And it was folded out to a full-length diagram, like a schematic of the Hindenburg, like an engineering drawing. I remember I took that book out. Um, one day she told me when I was older, when I visited the library, she said, you know, you're one of the only people who's ever taken this book out. <laughs> and she showed me the stamps. She said, these are all you. She said, when you were a kid, you came here, you would return, return the book. You'd wait about a week or two. Then you'd, Can I have the Hindenburg book again? <laughs> so what are you doing, just looking at it? Yes, a reading, you know, about the, the skin, the aluminum frame, the whole, like how they, where they got the hydrogen from, the whole bit. And I was obsessed and sort of captivated with the fact that if the U.S. had sold Germany the helium for the Hindenburg, it would probably right. not have blown up. But we were smart. We're like, nah, no, nah, we're not. Because we were only the only source of helium in the world at the time, one of the only sources. So I was always wondering why they never revisited that. Because, of course, there was a Goodyear blimp. You mean building a lighter than airship like that? Yeah. Was it you just know, not efficient? Because it yeah. looked like it looked glamorous when they would show how you could walk around and move. Now they must have gone slow though, right? They were too slow probably. I think you could do the crossing. I think it would sail um I think it only took 2 or 3 days to go across the Atlantic. So faster you know, than you a could, boat, slower than an airplane. I am correct. And one of the thing about the dirigibles about the the like or zeppelins like the Hindenburg was they were hard to maneuver. You know, yeah. it basically it's a big gas bag in the sky and if bad weather came you were fighting you off course the, yeah <laughs> yeah I, it just but you know that was the thing and they this particular ship the hindenburg had been designed to be floated by helium that was the scale everything was designed for helium and then when you know when world war ii was on the doorstep because the hindenburg flew right before that and when and then the the brown shirts took over they put the swastika on the tail fins and that's when everybody's like, eh, eh, this is this is going south. You're not getting the helium. <laughs> well, I think there's a helium shortage now. There a lot is, of these, yeah. A lot of these party places. So if, if we did have dirigibles, I guess we wouldn't be flying them. Yeah, I'm the a, gas, you know, I hear helium about helium. Helium would be so expensive. I hear about a helium shortage. Then I see the people blowing up helium balloons. And then, oh, I yeah. read he, then I read that helium is needed for some medical stuff, MRI equipment, all this other stuff. And I'm like, and you're selling it for balloons, but we need it for medical stuff? I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's just me. That's okay. just me being me. <laughs> All right, folks. Um, as you may know, uh, Deep Discount is a partner of ours here on the Focus Group, and we'd like you to visit them by visiting our site, focusgroupradio.com. Click on the Deep Discount logo. It's a shark called Sharky. He used to make regular appearances, and we had all kind of Sharky props, but arr, Sharky had to take a break. He may come back someday, but never like with the intensity he had before. Um, so this week, we have a 4K HD sale. Now, 4K is above Blu-ray in terms of resolution. If you have a 4K player, you know what I'm talking about. It's the kind of thing where you could walk up a 4K TV and a 4K player and a disc. You walk up to the TV, you could practically see the stitching on clothing that people are wearing. I mean, the resolution wow. is amazing. Ergo, if you have one of some of your favorite movies, they're going to look amazing in 4K. So what did you pick, Tim? So as I perused the sale, this popped as you out perused. of me, as I perused, <laughs> uh, what I what I shocked me is I I looked at this and I have a copy of it, but I actually don't have a actual real copy of the Wizard of Oz. Mm. Do you have one in your collection? Yes, we do. We of sure do. You. So you can get this and in, uh, in 4K at the during the uh, 4K Ultra HD sale. It's uh, twenty two dollars, so you save over thirty percent. And uh, so you're able to get it there at deep discount. One thing I, I don't have to, if you don't know what the Wizard of Oz is, and I, I, we're in the, you're listening to the wrong show. <laughs> the, um, but I did, it did remind me of the synopsis, and I looked it up. Do you remember the famous synopsis of that was written for the Wizard of Oz? Uh, it was it's just, something it about was, a girl drops, like a house drops on someone, a girl right. does something, yeah. So it's a guy named Rick Polito, and he'd been writing offbeat and hilarious synopsis of various movies, which were used for TV listings for years. And so they said the most famous one he did was for The Wizard of Oz. And uh, it was initially published in the, in, uh, in the LA Times. And uh, he said it's what everybody remembers him for. But the synopsis reads, so this is The Wizard of Oz, you know, tonight at eight. 
Transported to a surreal landscape, a young girl kills the first woman she meets, then teams up with three complete strangers to kill again. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yes, it is. <laughs> and I was, I, I, I remember, la- I thought, yeah, she meets up with, you know, she kills, she just kills some first person she meets, she kills, and then she teams up with three complete strangers to kill again. Okay. And you know what's Makes funny it sound about like that? a horror movie? <laughs> it's actually kind of, a- it's factual. Oh, it's very factual. Right. Yeah, it's not like he, he made it up. I mean, he, he uses terms like killing, but what's well, what they did with the witch? Three you complete know, Tim, strangers: think... the Tin Man, the Lion, and the and the uh, Scarecrow, and, the, and yeah, the Cowardly three Lion. Complete, meets three complete strangers to kill again. <laughs> you know, you know. I think the copy of the Wizard of Oz that you have, I gave you along with a copy of is it Dark Side of the Moon? Yes, with P- uh, Pink Floyd. To, and to, you to, had to, to wait for the third roar of the MGM line, and you hit right. the star, and that you. That was your soundtrack, and then what happened was when it got to that when it switches from black and white to color, money. money. Remember that? Ching ching. It is I too eerily coincidental. If it, it was coincidental, right? I do think it was, but it was super cool the way it lined up, and I'm glad you picked this because The Wizard of Oz is one of those movies that was shot in Technicolor, which means the original negatives are in pristine condition, and so in 4K, this thing must look like it looked when it was projected yep. the first time in a movie theater. Amazing. You're going to love my pick. <laughs> That's one of your favorite movies, Tim. Uh-oh. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, the movie I picked, which I think if you have a 4K player, 4K TV, and you want the best, and you love Blade Runner, you need Blade Runner, the final cut. And the final cut is the final cut because there was a couple of things the studio did before Ridley Scott released the film. Namely, the first time we ever saw the film, there was a voiceover that Harrison Ford did as Deckard, the detective, which Ridley Scott hated. That's been removed. There's a couple of little edits that he did uh, that really just cement the story and cement Rick Deckard's role in it, um, if you haven't seen the movie. So I would recommend uh, the 4K version of Blade Runner, the final cut. It has a lot of wonderful extras, and it looks spectacular. And I'm not kidding. I mean, this looks even better, actually, than it did when it came out the first time because when Ridley Scott remastered this for 4K and Ultra HD, he was able to go in to do a couple of tweaks to get rid of Like, Tim often talks about this movie. It's, it's rainy. There's things flying around. Those are the flying cars, the spinners. So he was able to remove some of the cables that actually held the cars that showed up. It was, it's one of the things you would rarely notice, but as a purist, the more you see the movie, you're like, wait a minute, there's a cable over there. So this is one that I would highly recommend. Is this um, one of these movies where you can watch and talk along with the dialogue? Meaning I know the dialogue? Or? Yeah. Yes, it's yeah. kind of, yeah, I've seen it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Bob will appreciate this when he hears our show because <laughs> he sometimes just looks at me like, you know, your brain is screwed up. I'm like, I know. And we do have a new release this week. And oh, how appropriate. The new release this week is called Mean Girls. Uh, and this is from the comedic mind of Tina Fey. Uh, it comes a new twist on the modern classic Mean Girls. New student Katie Heron is welcomed at the top of the social food chain by the elite group of popular girls called the Plastics ruled by the conniving queen bee, Regina George. <laughs> so it comes up with that name. It's brilliant. After making a secret alliance with the school's outcast to take Regina down, Katie must learn how to stay true to herself while navigating the most cutthroat jungle of all, high school. When this came out, this got great reviews. Um, and I just think that since Tina Fey's behind it, why not? So it's Mean right. Girls. Mean Girls. So um, it's, uh, as John mentioned, it's Deep Discount. It's the 4K HD sale. And you can get to Deep Discount by going to our website, focusgroupradio.com. You'll see the Deep Discount logo there. Click on it and start shopping away, particularly for this sale. And uh, I had picked The Wizard of Oz. And uh, John had picked Blade Runner, the final cut. And the new release this week is Mean Girls. So again, you can get to Deep Discount by going to our site, focusgroupradio.com. And uh, we appreciate their support of us and your support of them. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we've got a uh, business birthday and some shop talk. John had found a story about Aldi in the Isle of Shame. So we'll be talking about that toward the end of the show. So stay with us. You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com.
Now back to the focus group with Tim and John. Available pretty much everywhere. Welcome back to the Focus Group. John Nash with Tim Bennett. Focusgroupradio.com is the URL for our site. You'll learn about us, our partner Deep Discount, who we just visited with in our last segment. And, of course, you'll learn about uh, TFG Unbuttoned, our 20-minute podcast, the um, accompanying podcast. We, we call it many things, the accompanying podcast to the Focus Group. But without further ado, we have a business birthday. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. So uh, today's May 8th, and uh, celebrating, he was born May 8th, 1928, He'd be celebrating had he not had a heart attack and died. Uh, Lonnie Alfred Bo Pilgrim, or Bo Pilgrim, or Lonnie Pilgrim. Yes, the name Pilgrim. I don't know anybody with that last name. Did you? Mm-hmm. The last name Pilgrim? Yeah. Pilgrim only ever showed up in a book by Kurt Vonnegut called Slaughterhouse Five. Billy Pilgrim was the main character, but that's the okay. only time I've ever heard someone with the last name Pilgrim, right? And he actually lived it to the hilt. If you're watching along, John's got some pictures posted on the video. Of him with his pilgrim hat on. He's got a chicken named Henrietta, and there's a big statue of him, of his head with the pilgrim hat on at the company. So uh, he died at 89. He was co founder of Pilgrim's Pride, which was one of the largest chicken producers in the U.S. Uh, it was founded when he opened a feed store in 1946 in Texas with his older brother, Aubrey. His uh, brother had, had died uh, in 1966. And they had already amassed a net worth of over a billion dollars. And his brother, or he ended up taking over uh, running the company called Pilgrim's Pride Corporation. A multinational company currently, uh, to this day, still one of the largest chicken producers in the U.S., Puerto Rico, and Mexico. And um, they employ over 38,000 people. They have sales, uh, about eight and a half billion in sales. And uh, they operate in a number of different countries and uh, states around the U.S. They uh, trace their origins back to when they opened their feed store, as I said, in Texas. And uh, they were known to give away a free chicken. They give away free baby chicks with bags of feed that they would sell. <laughs> wait, wait, did they do that for the holiday, you said? No, they just did it all but the just time. Just all so year round? You, so if you were buying feed... Or whatever they would give you, give the away chicks. free baby okay. chicks with this seed. They said which expanded their business because mm. if you had more chickens, you had to feed them more, and then so forth, so on. So uh, they said Bo uh, would often wear traditional pilgrim clothing. <laughs> the CEO, he had a pet chicken Henrietta, which he brought around with him all the time uh, under his arm, and he was also featured. The chicken was featured with him in his pilgrim guard in many of the advertisements, and. Um, he said that uh, his whole philosophy was they wanted an egg on every table. So uh, it was a very vertically integrated um, company, they said. He was the Pilgrim's Pride as a supplier to Kentucky Fried Chicken and was actually named Supplier of the Year in 1997. Uh, other customers included, so if you buy these rotisserie chickens cooked, Walmart, Publix, Wendy's, mm. and they're the exclusive supplier for Costco. Really? Chickens, yes. Okay. Which for Costco alone, they supply over 50 million chickens a year. Um, it's a lot of chickens, 50 million. Three, wow. three pounds. And the chickens at Costco have to be three pounds, and they're marinated, and they put them right in the rotisserie. He, um, aside from being obviously a large corporation in Texas, uh, he supported Jeb Bush when Jeb Bush was running for, for president. He was a conservative. And there was at one time a bill in the Texas Senate where they wanted to change workers' comp. This was in 1989. And uh, Bo Pilgrim was wandering around the, the floor <laughs> in the I'm Texas. Sorry. Bo Pilgrim still Bo gets Pilgrim. Me, but... <laughs> So he's in the Texas Senate, and he handed out $10,000 checks to wow. nine of the 31 senators on the floor right before the vote. And, of course, so it was defeated. He said it wasn't to... to uh, he said, you know, defeating this bill had nothing to do with him handing out $10,000 checks to these senators because they said it was bribery. He said, no, they were simple campaign contributions. 
So that episode led for changes in Texas ethics laws. So they ended up changing. <laughs> can you imagine wandering I'm, around handing I'm, out I'm checks? I'm not surprised. Gonna, but how, like, how are you voting? How are you voting? When, I can see looking at your watch. When's the vote? Five minutes. Hey, here's 10,000. Here's I mean, 10,000. Yeah. So um, the company in, in 2009 was sold to, to uh, JBS Holdings, which uh, is a Brazilian-based multinational corporation. And now they are the largest meat processor in the world. And uh, they own 78, uh, 78%, 79% of uh, Pilgrim's Pride. Uh, and as I said, in 2017, at 89 years old, uh, Bo Pilgrim died. So he's our Not a bad birthday. age, by the way. I mean, had he no. made it into his 90s, that would be exceptional for a man. So I think he had a, a good span there. For our listeners, um, I won't say any names, but Tim and I were at a conference one year, and uh, we were going to interview someone who is a head of an organization, and the outfit they were wearing sort of resembled what you would see at Thanksgiving on a traditional, I just stepped off the Mayflower kind of thing, the buckled shoes, the whole bit. So while Tim was in that cropped haircut. Yeah. And what, and so with my Photoshop skills, I like whipped up the pic, I found her, the put the person's picture. I put a pilgrim's hat on and I think I did it pretty well too. No, you did it in record time. <laughs> and then I showed Tim, he practically crying with laughter. And when she actually came to sit with us, um, it was a good interview, but I think it was one of those things where, like, if I had had just had if 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 the screen was facing us and I had called up that picture, we would have ruined the interview because you would just start laughing, right? I found that picture the other day too. It, it, it's buried <laughs> somewhere really? in my yeah, it's buried somewhere in my photos. But to this day, I don't remember her name, but I remember her as the Pilgrim. And um, <laughs> you say, remember the time we interviewed the Pilgrim? Pilgrim. We both, we both know who it was. And we both laugh. I still don't remember her name, but or I remember her name the either. Pilgrim. Yeah, that, that was, was a good business birthday, Bo Pilgrim. Bo Not Pilgrim. only was he responsible Bonnie. for a lot of chickens, but also had to change the ethics laws in Texas because, hey, when's that? And checks yeah. on the floor right before on the, the floor. Vote. Here's here's ten k. How you voting? <laughs> well, I'm not. I haven't decided yet. Well, here's ten thousand. Make you think about it, <laughs> <laughs> Tim. There you go. Make you think about it. Right. That's... <laughs> All right. As we teased at the uh, start of the broadcast, and uh, we came back from break, um, found an article called. Uh, uh, sh I, I shortened it. The shoppers are a huge fan of Aldi's Isle of Shame. Um, now, I Tim introduced me to Aldi's years ago. Uh, I go there occasionally, I can, I, and you can find some great prices and some really good food stuff there. This has always surprised me, though, and that's why when I found this article, I, um, you know, I was like, oh, now it explains it. So Aldi is a privately held German discount grocer. They, they tout Walmart like sales pitches every day and low prices. They've operated in the U.S. since 1976. When they first opened a store in Iowa, they operate now more than 2,000 stores nationwide and 12,000 12, stores worldwide. So here it is. Inside every Aldi store is a single aisle of merchandise that mostly has nothing to do with groceries. The, real the retailer describes it as a rotating assortment of specialty items available for a very limited time. It could be anything from a garden hammock to a furry sweater for your pooch. The prices are startling, with many of these items costing just a few bucks. Aldi calls it the Aldi Finds Isle. Super fans have a more colorful alternative for it, and they call it the, uh, the Isle of Shame. So if you go into an Aldi, and yes, you'll find this aisle that just seems to have nothing to do, like bath mats or Tupperware. Like, we've we've bought stuff there for this exact reason, and Bob often always looks for, like, Christmas things or, like, especially when the holiday is over. Yeah. Have you bought from the Isle of Shame? Oh, uh, my God. I, I, could, I, could, I could take half the aisle with me. <laughs> <laughs> I bought candles. I bought these bamboo trays. Um, I did buy... Um, flower pots that disappeared. They didn't fit the aesthetic of the house. They were red, red flower pots that I like, but those seem to have disappeared. But um, no, I love the Isle of Shame. I love it. One thing about the Isle of Shame, which shoppers call it, that's not. There's nothing shameful yeah. about the Isle. But one thing I found really intriguing about it is it's the highest profit margin items in the store. So oh, you're really? already dealing with with things that are. You know, everything else they have to make on volume because their prices are really good for food items. And even though these items um, 
are discounted and the consumer is realizing a great savings, Aldi themselves is actually making a lot of money because that's just a higher margin thing. And that's why they're very careful about how they stock these aisles. Like So Tim, in the article, they talk about it being very seasonal. Um, so now I guess we're going to start seeing like summer things pop up in there. Yeah, so you'll you'll see um, there might be pool toys, there might be that sort of stuff. And what I did find funny, I thought this was almost like a odd lots where they would just pick up things that were overstocked, but they actually have a trend buyer mm-hmm. that starts way, you know, years in advance or months in advance. It says nine right? months, nine right. months to to try to spot trends and and uh, that helps them decide what sort of merchandise they're going to put in the aisle. So they actually, there actually is a science to it. It almost looks to me sometimes like it. So this is all, I'm thinking, oh, they got a deal on some leftover stuff somewhere. But there's actually trends that they follow, and then that's what they stock in the aisle. I had a friend that did that for Target. I was fascinated by the job. I thought, what a cool job. He would travel around to competitors. or All he did is travel around retail and see what were in stores and what was stocking. And I went with him one day to see how he did it. And, uh, and he would get, they would send him to Europe. He would go all over the place. But one day we went to this little five and dime store and they had all these candles of Santa Clauses. Like the and, shape, it was a mold. I'm sorry, they, they, yeah. weren't, they weren't candles. I'm reversing the story. They had chocolates of these Santa Clauses, but the chocolates had colors and so it was the red, the red Santa suit and the whole deal. And he looked at that and he said, well, we certainly couldn't afford to make these out of chocolate and we couldn't didn't have the process he goes but these would make great candles Mm. and so sure enough the following year the exact replica of that chocolate was done in a candle with a wick out of the head and he said that's how they find these things and um i thought it was uh interesting but they might look at colors of pots and pans it's how they look what's it look crusette decides what colors they're gonna make um I had a friend of mine too that she had talked about. She was responsible for the yellow on the Dyson vacuum. And um, <laughs> seriously, because that's like kind of a really big trademark. Uh, thing iconic, yeah, iconic. Yeah. She, she worked at Subaru in the in the interiors of the cars, and uh, so yeah, I I laughed. I I I go to Aldi quite a bit, and I so I went through and I just myself decided I would tell you what my latest go to things are. I don't know if you have any go-to things which you go to for, but they opened a new one here. The fresh produce is great, but they also have products. There's an Aldi page where you can go, f- certain products they only have for a limited time and like the frozen fruit section, frozen sections. Mm-hmm. And this thing popped up about this rhubarb pie, which I love strawberry rhubarb pie. My children so, know nothing of nothing store-bought Nothing of store-bought <laughs> So this pops up that it comes in rhubarb or it comes in apple. And get it while you can. And there was people stampeding to get these pies. They were a little more money. They were $15. So I, of course, ran and got one. Came home, threw it in the oven. It was delicious. Um, and it's only one time a year they have it around Easter time. They do these pies. And they were quite good. But I still go to all the time. They have these pita chips, which are about $2 cheaper than the Trader I know, Joe's chips. I know the chips. You recommended them to me. Yeah. Tomatoes, peppers, avocados, and apples, if you like the honey crisp, are far. They, they could be a dollar less a pound. The mm-hmm. Greek dressing's good. Frozen flatbread pizzas. Eggs were $1.69 a dozen. Two thirty nine dollars for brown. Now, this is when eggs were even going 4 or $5 a dozen. They're $1.69 there. And by the way... You did a whole thing, Tim, once on brown versus white. There is no difference, is there? There is no difference, but I do like a brown egg. Um, I don't know why. The um, It's the best place for cheese. Somebody turned me on to that, the cheese mm-hmm. section. Richard's got an oatmeal cranberry cookie there they have that he loves, and the German chocolate bars, the dark chocolate German chocolate bars. But those are my go-tos there, and then I, I pick up You're forgetting up other one stuff. holiday thing that you usually get there. This, uh, the, the stolen? Spellen, the stolen. The stolen. Loaf. Yeah. I didn't get it this year, but they did have it. Um, they had my it, parents, yeah. my parents' neighbors um, from Germany, swore uh, they were in Connecticut and they could never find the stolen. They said actually Aldi's had the best one that they've been able mm-hmm. to find since they were living in the states. It's a German um, German owned uh, grocery. They said they're going to open eight hundred more stores in the U.S. I hope they don't get oversaturated. Well, y- you know, we're we don't we have some downstate, but the one upstate used to be in a kind of a rundown plaza well they were seating yeah but they've done a major upgrade they moved to an entirely new location and when we walked into aldi the other day i was clean 
Everything's clearly marked. Of course, the Isle of Shame is is really in the center of the store. You know, they make the margins on Frozen. You know, everything around the edge of the right. store is what they make the margins on. They they make more on this the stuff in the Isle of Shame. But I could easily find. You know, I'm always amazed when I fill the bags and we go out and we put the cart back. We put the get the quarter out. And I've spent 40 or 50 bucks on two enormous bags of groceries, marinara sauce, frozen, ch- you know, like yeah, the marinara everything sauce you were talking about, Tim. And, and and I'm like, why don't I do this more often? Because it's actually as convenient, if not more so than going to Costco and you don't have to yeah. pay a membership fee. Yeah, I go once a week. The one thing I will say, I do not like grocery. My biggest complaint about Aldi was when I felt like they just, you come with your cart. And the stuff just gets zip, 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 and thrown in the cart, and then you got to repack it, right? Yeah. Take it outside. <laughs> what they've done here in, in Rehoboth Beach is they have done away with all but one human. So now it's all um, check out yourself. And it's the only place I like to check out the self because I don't feel like my stuff is running down the belt and being thrown in the cart, and I, I don't even <laughs> have my wallet out, and they're, they're looking for money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so this way, I can actually zip the item over the thing and put it in a bag. So for me, this is the only store in the universe I like that actually has self-checkout because I don't feel like I'm being rushed then. So I don't know. We'll see how long they keep it. But they opened up 11 self-checkouts and got rid of most of the cashiers. I used to, I the cashier, that you know, there's a cashier that at our Aldi that has been there since I started going. She's the sweetest woman, always a smile on her face, always, hello, how are you? Um... And she almost, I think she knows who, like who we are. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure. Sh- I don't think we have the self-serve upstate. I got to check that no. out. Um, and we actually know. I'm sorry we do. I take that back. There was a row of three of them. I, I prefer to go to her if she, I prefer to. Well, I got reprimanded because I opened my bags because you don't, you know, I, you bring nope. your own bags. Yeah, yeah. And I was trying to put the stuff in and I was slowing up the line. No. And they sit down, too, so they're seated. <laughs> and they've got those European cash drawers, so they don't even really have the proper places for money. But um, One time anyway. we went through the line, we had some of the... I, there's pita chips that... Are those, there's the come, ones that come in the box. Yeah, the box. But there's also one in a bag. I forget what we got in a bag, but somehow that ended up in the bottom of the cart first. And then... Uh, Something ended up on top of it, and all we heard was a slight crunching noise. And Bob does; those are all crumbs now. <laughs> yeah, that's what I don't like about them. They just zip, 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 zip things through. So that's why I'm actually delighted that they now have got this self checkout because I can actually open the bags and put the yeah. things in, so they're not just thrown in the cart. That'd be my biggest complaint of Aldi, but they seem to correct that now with the self serve. But so we'll see. And you can return anything at any time, apparently. Yep. Mm-hmm. Like Costco, I, yeah. Which I've not done. Have you returned anything to Costco? Nope. Or to, no. No. Nope. Oh, okay. I saw somebody, they were talking about complaining about people returning Christmas trees after Christmas. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, that, that one, <laughs> uh, that one That's blows my, favorite. my mind. Yeah. <laughs> so. Like, okay, you bought the tree, you put it up. <laughs> okay. So, hey, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us here on uh, the Focus Group. We appreciate you spending time with us. Learn all about us at focusgroupradio.com. While you're there, you'll also see links to our podcast, which is TFG Unbuttoned. You can down all, download all of our media there for free and take us along with you in your travels or in your errands or in your commute or to the gym or whatever you're doing. Uh, we want to thank our friends Deep Discount, who partner with us here on uh, the Focus Group. They've got a 4K uh, HD sale. Did I say that right? 4K, 4K HD, HD sale. Yeah. I always want to say 4HDK. That'd be wrong. 4K HD cell going on right now. I picked The Wizard of Oz. John picked Blade Runner, the final cut. And the new release this week is Mean Girls. So be sure to head over to Deep Discount through our site and uh, start shopping away. We hope you all have a good week. Remember, don't text and drive, arrive alive. And we'll see you next time on The Focus Group. Take care. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.